Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining this webinar. I'm Marta Kozlowska, Development Director at the Energy Institute. I'm sure many of you know the Energy Institute well, but for those of you who don't, we're an independent network of professionals covering the whole energy system. And working with our members, we help the industry to tackle urgent challenges by bringing together expertise and convening debate so that energy can be better understood, managed, and valued. The current crisis is an urgent challenge, having impacted numerous projects and causing disruption for their owners and contractors. So our expert speakers from HKA and DLA Piper will today discuss solutions that might be open to the industry. These companies don't require much introduction, so I'll just remind you that HKA is an independent provider of consulting and expert advisory services for the oil and gas process, construction and manufacturing industries working with clients worldwide. And DLA Piper is a global law firm with lawyers in over 40 countries. So to fully benefit from this webinar, uh, we'd like to encourage you to ask questions and you can do this by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Once you are in the chat box, please select the option all panelists from the drop down menu and type in your question. And all questions will go directly to the chair who will put them to the speakers during the panel discussion. And as the webinar finishes, you'll see a brief questionnaire pop up when you leave the session. Your feedback is, of course, very important to us. So please do take a moment to fill in this questionnaire. And now I'd like to welcome all our speakers. And in particular, I have pleasure in introducing the chair, Colin Johnson, a partner at HKA and a member of the Energy Institute. Colin has over 25 years of experience, including acting as a lender, equity investor, developer, as well as as legal and financial advisor. He has been appointed as an expert witness on several occasions and has worked in numerous countries on behalf of national governments, large companies and entrepreneurs, providing services amongst the others to power, oil and gas infrastructure and construction sectors. Colin, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Marta, and thank you to you and to Vicky and to the Energy Institute for uh helping us to put this together and for running it for us. Um, as people will be aware, on this session, we're going to be exploring the problems and the concerns that the owners and contractors are facing during the crisis and considering the range of their legal rights and remedies that are open to them before looking at what we might see in the foreseeable future and what lessons we can take forward. So that's what you will see reflected on the agenda in terms of the different areas that we are going to go through. And the first thing I will do in terms of that agenda is to actually introduce today's panel. Vicky, if you wouldn't mind turning to the next slide. So first of all, and I'm going to do this in the order of the way the presentations are coming to you. Uh, so David Moss, first of all, is a partner at DLA. Very relevantly for this session, he's advised the government legal department and Crown Commercial Services on the approaches that they should adopt on projects affected by coronavirus including model clauses for existing and new contracts. He's over the past 30 years acted for funders, contractors and suppliers at all stages of the develop delivery cycle on the administration of complex high value projects across many industry sectors. And that's both in the UK and globally. After David speaks, Caroline will take over. Uh, Caroline Pope has over 30 years of experience of disputes in the construction, engineering and infrastructure industries, also both in the UK and internationally, and she has a particular expertise in the MENA region. Chambers UK actually described Caroline in the following terms. Uh, in relation to Caroline, she's extremely bright, has great in-depth knowledge and is not frightened by anything. She's chairman of TEXA, the Technology and Construction Solicitors Association. After Caroline and David have finished, uh, Michelle Metz will then take over. Michelle is a partner at HKA who specializes in matters of project delay. Michelle's got extensive experience as an independent delay expert and has provided strategic delay analysis claims advice for international clients across a wide range of project types, power plants, oil and gas pipelines, refineries and semi-submersibles, 
power transmission, transportation, infrastructure, buildings, manufacturing facilities, rolling stock and IT. So that's a pretty broad list. Um, and then after we have had from all three of our speakers today, we will come back for questions and answers. So do please use the uh, panel session on the right and send your questions to all panelists. But now, if Vicky, we can move on to the next slide, I'll pass across to David. Many thanks for that introduction. Um, what is very clear that we are living in some incredibly un unprecedented times, and at a time that unprecedented challenge is being created for the delivery of projects, and particularly for projects which were negotiated in a different economic climate. Um, often as well, we're seeing greater client demands caused through the depression in the economic climate that that we are facing. Um, there is also um, difficulty for all in the industry across all sectors because of interpretation of application of law and guidance, uh, both domestically here in the UK, and of course we've got a difference between England and Wales and Scotland, uh, and in our, the international community. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to note that most of our infrastructure projects here in the UK uh, encompass supply uh, from participants to the supply chain from outside of the UK. Um, and, and that fragmented supply chain is causing huge difficulty. Therefore, in today's session, uh, we're going to just look at some of those issues in uh, the introductory sessions, which Caroline um, Michelle and myself are going to give um, and then hopefully pose discussion and question for, for debate and answers, uh, albeit in that changing tapestry. The first of the challenges which the industry has faced, and, and certainly as I say here in the UK, has been that the, the government at Westminster has not introduced legislation. Um, what it has done for the industry is, is apply guidance and has operated systems that should have been intentional in trying to keep sites open and operational. Uh, yeah, often, and we've seen, appreciate now six months in, most notices, everybody understands in theory what the, uh, the application, what the uh, effects have been, uh, but there has obviously been change around, for example, the two metres to the one distance of uh, operation of say, social distancing where possible. We've also had Public Health England and Health and Safety Executive all, also taking steps in terms of protocol and, and regimes. And this afternoon we'll consider some of those uh, effects on productivity and the operation of sites. I think the biggest challenge that we're facing, uh, as already touched on, are those cross-border supply chains. Um, there are instances where we're saying governing law of the contract, but of course suppliers are dealing with uh, the application of local law in their own country, and that is having huge impact on the supply of labour, plant and materials and equipment. Uh, we're also seeing imposition of legislation, uh, particularly here in the UK, with regard to insolvency. And, and again, we'll, we'll touch on, on some of those. Uh, Vicky, if you could just pass on to the next slide, if you would, please. I guess w one of the, the bigger issues we've got is, is the, distinct, the difference between the approach that's been adopted by the public sector uh, but it's also uh, an approach that's been applied by certain private sector industry bodies. The, the public sector, because of the appetite and the economic needs to keep the industry moving, to keep sites operational, has adopted a process that has been recommending of not applying contract terms rigid, rigidly, apologies, to consider equitable adjustment to contracts and to act fairly and responsibly. But of course, that creates huge tensions and the difficulties when considering the obligations and indeed for 
all participants to a project and indeed the advisors as to how to apply the contract terms, when to apply the contract terms, or more pertinently, a departure from those contract terms. Um, at this point, we probably have uh, the biggest distinction between the public sector with the pipeline and ability to possibly award future contracts and to and to generate the stimulus the economy needs and also the, the political requirements to protect jobs um, and the imposition of what it considers best practice when considered against the private sector of project viability, looking at the balance sheet of a particular project and indeed the, the needs of shareholders and stakeholders. Um, allied to that, uh, we've also seen uh, the notices for force majeure, uh, in, in, in particular what is force majeure, the contractual definitions of force majeure as opposed to and when dealing with international contractors here in the UK, those who are used to working under civil code leg, uh, regulation where force majeure is a recognised concept. Uh, and it's important to understand what the needs of force majeure are, what the circumstances and the triggers are. Does it simply give a relief for time? Uh, or indeed, when compared with change of law, uh, how do you look at the, the rights, the remedies, uh, and indeed what may give ability for time and money. And again, we'll come back and, and discuss that and hopefully uh, concentrate on it a little bit more in our question session. Uh, there will also be opportunities through the contract and the notice provisions for termination. It may be that, for example, as we see in standard form contracts such as FIDIC, that the, where there's a, a continuing or an aggregating effect of the event of force majeure, there is a right of termination and that right of termination may be triggered by the contractor itself, which of course uh, does impact on the negotiation uh, of uh, uh, compensation through the machinery itself. Uh, we're seeing lots of issues at the moment in terms of how to enforce the contractual rights and as I say this huge tension between the public and private sector. Uh, so in terms of how those matters are manifesting in practice, if I could pass over to Caroline. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm dealing particularly with contract management, and this is going to sound like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, I'm afraid but it's absolutely important that you continue to administer the contract in accordance with its terms, unless you have agreed something different. All too often, uh, clients come to us and say that they have actually departed from the contract, they haven't done this, they haven't done that. It sometimes seems to be the default position. I would stress that step number one, and despite all the government um, suggestions that we should not be enforcing contracts too rigidly, it is absolutely imperative that you take the basic steps to protect your position. If you protect your position, you can argue about the outcomes. If you don't protect your position, you're in serious difficulty. This is particularly important when it comes to notices. Sorry, could you change the slide? I realise that they haven't automatically changed. Um, it's particularly important when it comes to notices. If you're the contractor, so often nowadays contracts are written with notice being a condition precedent. If you don't give a notice, you have no entitlement to either time or money. And if that occurs, you have got no grounds later on to be arguing that you should. So put your notice in, protect yourself and talk about the consequences later. Too often I've had cases where, particularly when I was in the Gulf, where a contract administrator would say to the contractor, oh, don't, it's very, very aggressive, don't put notices in, it, it'll be all right. That's all right at the very beginning of contracts, but all too often, when positions harden towards the end and you're starting to think about your final account settlements, that is when the contract administrator frequently will say, oh, well, no, we didn't really mean that. 
you've got a condition precedent, you didn't get give your notice, the lawyers get involved, you end up arguing about estoppel, you end up arguing about waiver. Totally unnecessary, protect your position, get your notices in. It's also very important you keep your notices correctly um, pick up what it is you're claiming your entitlement to. Here, as David mentioned, it's likely to be under a force majeure clause and or a change of law clause. Both have usually have slightly different entitlements, one usually just to money, the other to time and money. So it's important you put in separate notices. You don't conflate them. Make it clear you're not just putting in a claim for COVID. It should be one and or the other and identify separately what the consequences of each of those are. Also, we're in a very un, un, uncertain position where uh, the law is changing on a rapid basis, perhaps not necessarily in this country, but in other countries on big international product um, uh, projects. And therefore, what I would advise is that you actually, even if you can't keep track in all the different jurisdictions of what the law changes are, that you're actually working closely with your supply chain and getting them to let you know so that you can ensure that notices are going up the line to pick up what the different changes are. That is really very, very important. I'm going to now sound like a crack record, I'm afraid. David has already made the point, I think, that um, you need to have records. Claims are claims, claims just because it's a COVID situation, it makes no difference. You're still going to have to substantiate your claim, your entitlement. And so it is absolutely important that you do keep really good records and those records will have to pick up the fact that the law is changing it's changing on a regular basis what was the difference between day one and day six when something changed when the did the, did did it segments changing from two meters to one meter actually change and i think here the mindset should be we've moved from somewhere where we had very tight restrictions to slowly relaxating relaxing the uh, the, 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 the restrictions on which you're working. And actually, the employers, the contract administrators are going to be saying to the contractors, well, hang on a minute, that, that change of law actually relaxed what you're meant to be doing, so therefore your productivity should, should have picked up. So at each pinch point when there's a change, you need to be able to demonstrate why it is that that did or did not affect your productivity. We know that productivity, we know that disruption, we know that the measured mile is always extremely difficult to prove and it's going to be as difficult in these situations. A few words of advice, I'm sure Michelle is going to be talking a lot more about it, but things like taking photographs of photographs uh, tell a thousand words, using drones to take photographs to show who's working in what areas, the effect on those areas of people um, having to work in restricted spaces. Basic things, it is extraordinary still that we have claims that come across our desks, I've had one very, very recently, where there weren't effective login, log out into, onto site, so that actually you couldn't prove how many people you had before lockdown and how many people are logging in post lockdown. One would hope with government track and trace that those sort of things are not happening, but again, you need to just check. Keep up updating your, your programs. If you have got programs and you need to put in new programs, that's important. And David mentioned termination. Termination is not usually something that one wants to do, but it may well give you an opportunity. So if you give in a notice of default, it might well bring the other side to the table to actually start negotiating around some of these slight relaxation in contract terms. But I would repeat that most important thing is that if you do make any relaxation in contract terms, you document it. I'll come on to that, please, on the next slide. So what should you be thinking about ahead of the second lockdown? It, we've always got a small window. We, we've went, we went through that panic stage at the beginning when it was what how sites closed, how are we going to start getting up, how are we going to work through? Most sites are now up and running, but probably with reduced productivity. The question is, if a second lockdown comes, what is the effect of that? The difficulty you all will have is that, of course, you're already working in a reduced environment, um, reduced productivity, but it may well be that next time round, the argument will be that unless the site is closed, you're going to be able to continue to work as effectively and product productively 
in the future in the second lockdown as you can in the first if the governments don't actually require sites to close. So again, what's important is to ensure that you're really capturing as of now, if you haven't got good records, historically, you've got very good records to show what the current position is, who's working where, what they're doing. Start doing measured miles as of now, that will help you. If your contracts aren't particularly clear, and if you've been able to negotiate and bring the other side to the table, you need to start making sure that you, you document that. It is possible um, whether or not you can achieve it. And in my experience, particularly in the private sector, I haven't come across a single employer who has yet been prepared to relax the terms of his contract, but it's worth having a go. But if you do, you need to make sure that is documented. Other things you can be thinking about ahead of a second um, potential shutdown um, is, is how you can protect your supply chain more. Should you be making some advanced payments? If you're making advanced payments, you need to ensure that you have advanced payments bonds in place. Could you help by increasing the frequency of payment? Those two things are very important, potential things to offer, but it's really crucial that you do thorough financial checks on the suppliers if you're going to be doing that. Off-site materials, and um, that's an area where it's really important, if you can, to ensure that you've got um, a clause in your contract requiring, um, enabling you to take delivery in the sense of off-site materials that they're vested in you at the point that they're inspected in foreign um, in factories. Made more difficult nowadays by the fact that normally um, the engineer, somebody would jump on an airplane, go inspect and put a sticker on and say this, this, this has been vested. You may have to think about getting a local agent to be able to do that if you can't fly in, but it is really important to be able to properly identify those materials, those off-site materials that are actually vesting in yourself. The government in the UK, I don't, I'm sure you all know this, the new Business and Planning Act 2020 has allowed, um, has allowed people to apply to local authorities under their deemed extension of working hours. You can now extend your working hours on site up to 9 p.m. at night, Monday to Saturday, and the local authority has to have very compelling reasons not to extend. And if they don't respond to your application within 14 days, it's deemed to be extended. So that is quite something that is really quite useful. Finally, let me come to this issue about contract variation or standalone agreements. I think if you're in the employer, it is really important that you think about whether you want a variation, a, a change to your contract that's going to be across the piece or whether it's COVID related. It may well be that you want just a very short standalone um, side agreement if you're going to be relaxing your notice provisions for just for COVID, but it's really important you work out whether it's just COVID or whether it's going to be more extensive than that. I always favour deeds of variation because I think it just makes everyone think about the implications on each clause of the contract on other clauses, but I'll leave um, that up to your lawyers to advise, advise you. Thank you. David? Uh, and just very briefly, over to Michelle. I, I think we just wanted to address some of the points which we're seeing in terms of either the drafting of new contracts or indeed the amends, the deed of variation, which Caroline has, has just referenced in terms of uh, ongoing projects. Um, is the, the first is the obvious, is that as, as we're seeing, uh, is that the, the argument as to force majeure, change of law, there would be other uh, incidentals around quarantine or access third party restrictions uh, is addressing as to whether or not you are compensating time or it's time and or money. Um, we see and again of the uh, you know the very nature of the disease as designated by the World Health Organization as COVID-19 uh, is that in standard forms and indeed in many of the bespoke forms the definitions are not clearly clear enough or wide enough um, you know, tensions are created and as we enter into new contracts as this position develops what we would say is capture and accurately adequately better define uh, COVID in the contract. Um, I, 
Colin very kindly in his introduction referenced the work uh, I've been doing that we as a firm have been doing with uh, government legal department uh, and indeed we have all seen the template boilerplate clauses that have come out of a number of the industry bodies. All we would say is exercise care and caution. Make sure that those boilerplates are fit for purpose and that they are delivering for you the objects that you want for your contract. Um, Caroline's already touched on the, 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 the concepts and the concerns. COVID is not bookended. Uh, the, the follow the science, that off use phrase, which is, has now been uh, jettisoned by uh, uh, Boris and number 10, uh, is, is really just considering what the future uh, impacts of lockdown could be. Uh, we've already touched on pricing and termination, uh, so it may well be those are points which come back it, it to in our uh, open session on Q&A. Uh, but I think at this point, uh, Michelle, if I could pass on to you. Many thanks, David. Many thanks, Caroline. And I'm just going to be echoing probably quite a few points that have already been made. Um, but I'm just changing up slightly. I'm going to be sharing with you um, some of the experience that I've gained recently working on five COVID affected power projects. So just a little bit about the background of those projects. So they're either based in the Americas or the Middle East. They're either oil and gas projects or power plants. They all have a common theme. They're all international complex projects with multinational owner joint ventures and multinational contractor joint ventures. Each one of them has a global supply chain, and that's in terms of the design houses being um, situated in different countries around the world. The materials and the equipment are coming from all over the globe. Management resources are situated in uh, the client's main um, offices, which are global, and also in some of them, the labor resources are not in country, they're coming from out of country. So really today, I just wanted to share with you some of the common themes that I'm seeing across those five particular projects. And obviously because they're of a large global nature, what I've basically been seeing is I've been involved with them from very early stages. So really from the beginning of February onwards, because we were seeing that global wave of how COVID basically affected uh, China first, where on one particular one of the projects, a lot of the modules were being manufactured. So we were seeing the early effect there from COVID. And then um, basically as COVID has spread around the world, it's had a delaying and disrupting effect on the global supply chain. And it's really affecting the supply chain at different points and due to very many different causes. It's quite a unique situation. And of course, because of these type of projects, we're seeing basically there's been restrictions in country that have been affected materials and resources coming into that country or out of that country. We've also seen the global supply chain being affected by out of country restrictions. So the initial ones in China, for example, um, and how that's going to be effective going onwards, because one particular uh, job that I'm working on has been highly affected by um, commissioning resources. So, for example, that particular job, they've been waiting for dedicated commissioning resources were situated in one particular country and they've suffered um, big delays both from in-country restrictions and then out of country i.e where those resources are based now being restricted and one of the frustrations from the client has been well why can't we get resources from somewhere else well it's not always that simple because these are very dedicated resources and there's only a few com companies that actually supply those kind of resources. Um, one of the things that I'm also seeing from some contractors is, and I know that David touched on this earlier, is that they're trying to advance global type claims, i.e. just saying that they've been affected by COVID. Well, global claims don't work out of COVID situations, and they're certainly not going to be the best type of claims to be advancing during the COVID situations. 
there needs to be much more granularity on it. And obviously, as a scheduler, and I deal in matters of delay, one of the big sticking points that I'm seeing on all of these type of contracts is there has been certainly under-reporting in the programs in terms of the delay prior to the emergence of COVID-19, which is really affecting the claims being advanced and going forward. So, Vicky, if you could just move on to the next slide for me, please. So really, um, one of the practical measures or a lot of the practical measures I think that you can do to protect your claims, et cetera, going forward is it's not unique to the COVID situation. I mean, I, I would be giving this advice if it wasn't a COVID situation, but they really need to be reiterated. And there are some that are specifically that you can do um, to help the situation. So really, I think one of the major points is making sure that the schedules are realistic um, and that um, basically they have been reported correctly in terms of the progress, in terms of the critical path, so that you can then build your claim upon those particular schedules. And then once you have that basis and baseline schedule, it's making sure that those are updated on a regular basis they're realistic and they're basically supported by updates and forecasts and obviously at the moment it's not that easy to 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 forecast correctly it's never easy to forecast correctly in any case but with so many different changes in terms of the covid situation around the world it's very very difficult so my advice has been to update and forecast as best you can with the supported information that you have to back that up and basically update it as regularly as you can. In terms of advancing claims, they need to be clearly identified. So the critical paths activities that are in delay need to be clearly identified. You know, is it in engineering? Is it in supply chains in terms of um, materials? Is it on site? Because all of those particular areas uh, may have a different effect. And basically, you need to be making sure that there's a clear identification and substantiation of all the causes of critical delay. Because as Caroline and David said, there's different parts of the contract that are going to be related to those different types of, uh, different types of causes of delay. And they might be uh, that you would just get relief from extension of uh, relief from damages on that, sorry, extension of time for it, or there might be cost implications with it as well. So they need to be very, very clearly defined and substantiated. Um, just saying that it's a COVID related claim is not going to be enough because has it affected the design house, for example? Has it been the engineers who have been delayed? Has it been the supply chain, i.e. you couldn't get the materials out of China, say, for example, because all of these will have a, have a different mechanism under the contract. One of the things that I am seeing that's working very well from a number of the contractors um, and the clients are liking this going forward is, is the production of a COVID-19 impact log, because there's so many different parts of the project that are being affected by COVID. Um, so actually uh, writing up each one of these is time quite time consuming. So I've seen logs being advanced, which are on big Excel spreadsheets and basically giving the details of the activities that have been affected, what's been affected, why they've been affected, how it's been affected and the substantiation with it. And those are being regularly updated on a monthly basis and then sent through to the client to review. So all of the substantiation and the records are there. Another thing that I know that Caroline touched on as well is um, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of the contractors, and we have also been doing this when we've been having a look at the claims. Is basically making sure that there's a timeline of the COVID nineteen event in country and out of country because it is changing on such a regular basis that you need to make sure that you're on top of it all of the time. And by country, if you're dealing with an international project of a global nature. And in terms of records, yep, I'm just going to say again, records, records, records. You need to make sure that you have these regular updates and that the records are fit for purpose. These don't just produce records for record's sake. They need to be clearly identified 
They need to be clear in terms of making sure that they're dated, uh, the area of the works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the resources, the materials that are being affected. Um, yeah, there can't be enough records as far as I'm concerned, and they need to be records of the right quality uh, to be able to help with the substantiation of the case. So that's just a little bit about the experience that I have currently um, working on energy projects in uh, who have been affected by COVID. So I'm now going to pass back to our chair, Colin. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you to all three of you. So um, plenty of food for thought there. Um, I do have various questions already, which I will start on in a second. But just to remind people, if you have got questions to our panelists, you have a chat box on the right hand side of the screen. If you select all panelists from the drop down box and then type in your question, then I can uh, select from amongst those questions to actually relate them to the speakers. So I will pick first of all a theme that came across from all three of the presentations to some extent, I think, which was the cross border nature of the supply chain. And ask maybe Caroline first whether you're seeing tensions on contracts that involve non UK domicile participants in the supply chain. And if you are seeing that sort of tension, what particular steps are you seeing being taken to help to address that? Yes, we are seeing it, particularly um, for supply of large pieces of equipment, materials. Uh, the difficulty is that it, it's very difficult, to, but without that, there isn't really an answer because by the time you've actually gone out into the market to try and source an alternative, because it looks like one item is going to be in delay, it is already going to be increasingly a delay on the project. So people, my clients are looking at it, thinking about it, but actually in general, they've decided to stick with those people who they, they're using, who they've already entered into a contract in their supply chain, and just looking to see if there are any ways they can ease the process. But sadly, often the answer is no, it's not, and it is going to be causing a very real delay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think if Colin, if I just come in there, because I, I think Caroline, uh, absolutely right there, Colin, that one of the the real difficulties we're seeing, and I'm sure Michelle's examples there of the of the projects in uh, uh, through China in the early days of this are, are are evidence that we're often seeing where the substantive or the governing law of the of the contract uh, is different from the tensions that are being experienced be it through the supply chain be that through people or equipment um, and the there is no one size fits all magic formula uh, and and you know ultimately there is a project to deliver and i think probably never more so has there been the need for effective communication and, and collaboration between the parties to, to the contract. Absolutely, as Michelle has said, records, records, records. But you know, the delays and the difficulty of uh, you know, equipment that is not able to, to be delivered or design details that are not able to be completed or people who, who are not able to travel are all component elements which are, are having an impact on project program and indeed therefore completion date the output the triggers to revenue for for the kit uh, and pragmatism and discussion as opposed to you know we have seen situations where immediately the knee-jerk reaction is you know, this is a breach we have to serve uh, well we have to take the steps you know i think that it's at that point is okay well what are those steps that can be taken so it's yeah. not it's it's an it is and not an easy situation. Uh, and again, hopefully this is something that would promote some debate with uh, with the colleagues out there in the audience. Absolutely. Michelle, you want to say anything on this one? Um, I mean, I, I haven't really got too much more to offer on that. I think one of the interesting bits is gonna be where we're seeing 
um, the projects uh, kicking back into life is some of the ramp up of the resources, for example, is being is quite problematic with getting visas, etc. And you know, whereas before they, there would have been no no issue with that, and they could have ramped up fairly quickly. We're now seeing that there are problems with ramp ups of resources that are taking much much longer than they would have done in the past. So because that you know it all is dependent on where the resources are coming from as well. So yeah. Michelle, just on, just on that, then we mm. today we absolutely wanted to look at the at the practical as opposed to deep diving into any of the regulation of the governing law. Uh, for both yourself and 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 Caroline there, with the you know huge experience in the MENA region, um, you know, a difficult concept, but of course where we see those huge migrant. Uh, labour forces from Nepal and from Bangladesh and uh, the unspoken gangmaster type situation. So uh, I just wonder what, what's happening. Do, do we see any ways around that of trying to bring in labour or is it really impossible given the, the control on labour that exists and not only in that region but many others around the globe? I'm not sure that I'm seeing that so much, but what I am seeing is because there are some of those countries like India, for example, that is now being heavily impacted and on one particular job I'm working on, a lot of the labor force was coming from there. They are really struggling to get labor and having to go out maybe to different countries and that is taking time to do it. So yeah, it's just, inherent problems because the effect of COVID is affecting different countries at different times. I mean, a lot of the contractors are trying to be dynamic and they're trying to mitigate and trying to work around it. But it seems that they have one solution and then it gets affected again by another situation with COVID. So it's all such a big knock on effect at the moment. That's just what I'm seeing. Um, uh, which is which is why, Michelle, I thought you're the, I, th I think the, um, the, the COVID impact log mm. is crucial because I think yep. it, 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 it's impacting so many more areas than one immediately thinks of and actually capturing those and actually having that in place now so it's keeping your house in order. If you've got the log there, it's, it becomes a mindset. Actually, it may well become a mindset for logs for disruption in general in projects going forward for all times, which would um, overcome our, our records basis. But I think it is very, very important. And it's a similar issue that um, I think is also impacting in the UK with um, a lot of the workers, European, we have some, we have a lot of European workers working in, in, in the UK who returned home um, when, when COVID, and, uh, COVID struck and uh, seemed reluctant to come back because of Brexit. So for us, unraveling the impact of Brexit with COVID is going to be an, an issue in this. It's very specific and domestic to the UK, but it will also be a very interesting one to see how that comes through in the claims. Absolutely. And I, and I think the point that you touched on previously as well in terms of supply chain and, and, and actually talking with your supply chain to, to find out in essence what problems you have that are coming that you may not yet have appreciated. I think may also tie into that. So it's it, it's that not just the COVID impact log maybe right now, but it's kind of almost a, a COVID awareness person or group that's actually trying to think through what all of these different impacts could be and make sure that you're documenting where, wherever you can um, and also you're mitigating wherever you can, picking up the, the sort of the point that Michelle made in terms of the labor and, and looking maybe in advance of where alternative sources of labour could come from. But coming I think, back I think to that's right, Colin. I think what we're seeing as well is that some of the big equipment suppliers are making decisions as they ever did, but because of the global impact of this as to which projects to prioritise. And I think it would be naive of any of us to think that the decisions on the priority are not linked to financial exposures and, and distress on projects. Um, so, so that they they are, you know, redirecting equipment to 
projects where they are suffering manufacturing delay because, because, because. Uh, so it, it is going to be an evolving, changing situation, which absolutely brings to the fore the awareness that you're talking about and the contract administration. And Gruff, it's, it's actually sort of having that discussion with your manufacturers to make sure that you're still on target. And then, you know, where you are in the in the level of orders, maybe, you know, picking all of that up. Let me come back to um, the records, records, records point. Um, because there was a question that's come out in terms of, okay, but, but how does that really help? When you get to a contract termination, because it's what really matters is the completion time. Michelle, do you want to start on that one? Happy to. I mean, yeah, I mean, like I said before, I think in terms of records, it's so important to have the records that are fit for purpose. Um, and in terms of knowing exactly where you are, I mean, you have to make sure, and it's a point that I made earlier about what I'm seeing a lot of on the jobs um, and where there is a sticking point is actually making sure that the schedule is up to date and that there is an identification of delay that has already occurred, for example. So you need to make sure that the records are up to date, that the programs are progressed correctly, that the resource records are all there, that the equipment records basically record all of the equipment that is on site or coming to site. So it's making sure that you have across the board all of the records that are going to be able to substantiate your point about where you are in terms of progress and how much that you've done. So I don't know if anybody else wants to come in or has anything else to add to that. No, the only point I would add, Michelle, is that it again, it, talking about it apropos of, of the COVID, but this is a general, yeah. general point across the board for any claim on, under any contract of any sort in, in the industry. But the point I would make is that when acting for the, the purchaser, the employer, presented with a claim with a lot of substantiation and granularity, it is very much harder not to properly engage with the contractor. And therefore, your point about termination, um, Colin, and bringing it back to that, if, if, as, as, if you can really justify the fact that you're due an extension of time, you're probably not going to be getting into termination territory because you're probably if you're the contractor you're actually going to be in dialogue yeah i think that's right and i think i think as well colin that you, know, you pose the question you know why do records really matter and in the situation that we're uh, we're seeing at the moment with the the uncertainty of covid and i think as michelle has has, has given graphic examples to that we're seeing at all levels of the supply chain from main contractor through specialist contractors, notification why, because they, there is a requirement within 14, 28 days, as soon as practicable to serve the notice. And a statement be that of force majeure or change of law caused by COVID has occurred. Um, that, yeah, that there is, the point of the detail and the substantiation is an absolute must for, I guess, for two reasons. First, that most of the contracts on the complex, sophisticated um, schemes that delegates will be involved in have got mandatory step through dispute escalation provisions. And, and the real issue here is that you, you, you may be finding that there are enforceable decisions be that of time or money that you will, will be temporarily binding that you might want to unravel at final account or at the takeover operations certification whatever is the trigger um, i think the the second point as well is the contracts in terms of the definitions will refer to the impacted or the affected works actually in progress and that which was the 
impact of the same notified event or circumstance. And again, as, as Michelle has said, and I think Caroline and I and our teams are seeing this, that COVID is just being used as the panacea, the blame all for every failure on all projects up to, certainly in, in, in the West, February, March of, of 2020. And you absolutely need to distill and, and, and understand specifically what it is of the work actually in progress and the notified event that is causing, has caused, will cause the continuing delay. But, uh, and uh, bringing it again back, to, back broadly to termination, I think the this, the issue is is that this is a global problem. This, these pro these problems are being experienced on virtually every project anywhere in the world. I exaggerate slightly, but the point is if you terminate, if you're employing, you terminate because the contractor is in so much delay, just how long is it going to take you to find another contractor who's going to be able to deliver it anytime soon? And probably the answer is you won't. And I think it's possibly at that point when those realizations start hitting, that actually we might end up with a slightly more constructive dialogue between contractors and, and employers. And, and on that note, um, you know, is both from a legal and a practical point of view, you know, is joint scenario planning between the owner and the contractor or the subcontractor something you've either, either seen already or if you haven't seen it, is it something that you think would be helpful? I see it on one of the jobs I'm working on at the moment. So um, actively, the client has reached out to the the um, joint venture contractor and asked if they can be transparent, sit down, and put together the scenario type planning. Um, it's early days for that still, and I think there's still a bit of wariness on both sides about where that's going at the moment, um, because neither side wants to hang themselves out to dry, so to speak, so they're kind of like being quite tentative about it. But I'm seeing it progress. There needs to be an honesty, I think, on both sides, and actually what, what one of them have done is they're putting together a kind of Scott schedule type of scenario planning about things that they want to discuss and where they agree and disagree on points and then how they're going to remedy that going forward. Um, I'm only seeing it on one job job at the moment, but I think it would be useful to do. I think it it, it would definitely um, assist the projects going forward and maybe have a better relationship between both parties. Um, yeah. I haven't seen it on any projects that I'm involved in at the moment, but I think it would be an absolutely excellent idea. But I think you're right. I think there would be a scepticism by employers that they might be letting the contract off the hook somewhere, um, which is such a shame. It makes everything sound so as though we're, we're, we're just preparing ourselves for, for battles and it shouldn't be thus. You know, I don't, I hardly dare mention the partnering word, but if there's a, a scenario, um, and a circumstance when one should be trying to work more together, it is through this pandemic. Yeah, I think, and it, it just supplement the points that, that have been made, Colin, at the moment, and it is relatively uh, limited on uh, three or four with our uh, projects colleagues that there appears to be a nervousness or a reluctance, and that may be because of the project viability or, or the bankability, um, you know, we, I guess we've seen in a, in a number of regions now, um, you know, private equity investment or, or the you know, mezzanine. And, and of course, if projects are cancelled or, you know, I guess there's Two stages of that. If there are ongoing projects, it's 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 what's the cost of the delay, or what could be the the effect of, of postponing or indeed cancelling projects prior to commencement. Uh, but you know the scenario setting, the the, the situation is here, um, and you know burying the head in the sand is is not going to assist. Absolutely, no, that that makes perfect sense. All right, which, which actually, can I, or can I just pick on that because it's something that's e easily forgotten. It is really important to always take your funders 
along with you in any decisions, particularly if it's looked like you're going to be varying contracts in any significant significant way. No, I think that's absolutely critical in, in terms of the ongoing impacts of this. One of the biggest areas I think that is still to hit fully is the financing impacts. And, and that comes in terms of changes to contracts. It comes in terms of refinancing. It comes in terms of extra funds needed to be raised for the next stage of exploration, for example. And for all of those reasons, you need to be actually taking a funding. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Yeah. I think as well, um, Colin, the double, the double whammy where, uh, you know, in, in the hydrocarbons, the uh, upstream is, you know, the combination here of the impact and the downturn on the market is is, is just the ability of and, and indeed the appetite of the employer to accommodate as opposed to where you've got a lot of the relationships are on framework are, are simply demanding more for less or demanding the same for less and, and you know there's a there's a, a tension and a pinch point that no, it's, it's it's absolutely true, and for an employer, you know, it's I understand governments like the UK government saying be flexible, but if you have an employer that is dealing already with a with a project that is no longer viable at current oil prices, actually, what scope do they truly have to be flexible um, when they're facing such difficulties themselves? Um, yeah. We are rapidly running to the end of our hour, so if I can ask all three of you, literally for one view a piece in terms of one piece of advice for preparing for what may come next in terms of what contractors and owners should be addressing now. So from my point of view, it always, and I'm, it's, it's my area of expertise, it's make sure your programs are as up to date as they possibly can be, and they are realistic going forward because it makes life a little bit easier for your claim scenario. So yeah, program updates and records. <laughs> Thank you. My, mine would be in terms of advice is just, just always follow the contract in terms of the protection you need. And thereafter, you can always argue Employers put they put condition precedents in for a purpose, and if they then argue that you shouldn't be using it, you should be asking them why they put it in their contracts in the first place. Um, yes, there were, someone's asked the question, will there be specific problems coming from Brexit on top of COVID? Almost certainly there will be. We only have to look at Kent becoming a car park. At the moment, we can get supplies through. Once they're actually manufactured, we might have whole new supply issues, um, I'm, I fear, in the spring. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I think a combination of, of both of those uh, in, in addition to, as we've discussed, the variation to existing contracts, I think is, is very carefully um, with your COVID register is, is an assessment of what your needs, your objectives are, um, um, and being very careful as, as to how you are going to amend, how you're going to vary. Um, because, as I say, the difficulties at the moment, it is a rapidly changing position. Um, there is no settled law. And, and worryingly, the pandemic is not bookended. We just do not know the depth or the extent of, of, uh, of the continuance of the situation. Thank you. No, absolutely. Um, and Sebastian, I'm very glad we managed to get to your question. I thought we uh, might not be able to, but Caroline extremely neatly included that within what she was saying. When I put my glasses um, on, was able to read it, Sebastian. Apologies. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's absolutely fine. And I guess the, the final point that I would perhaps leave people with is just because you've already had all the discussion of what is and isn't force majeure, for example, or what your contract covers first time round, the foreseeability may be very different when we're going into this a second time and we're actually looking at it knowing that supply chains may be cut, knowing that labour may not be available from the same places that it is normally. And so there may be higher expectations for what you as owners or contractors have to do to address that in future rounds of the pandemic. So with that, I'm conscious we need to wrap up. So uh, uh, thank you very much. And I think 
Vicky and uh, Marta will close off for us. Thank you, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Thank you very much, all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this session. I'd like to thank our panelists and the chair uh, for, for all these valuable uh, contributions and the insights. And do please um, uh, leave us your feedback as you leave the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>